Please say I'm joined now by a presidential historian, Dr Laura Ellen-Smith, to talk us up to the moment when we expect to hear from former President Trump. Um, he's going to be in Trump Tower. Yes. I mean, the symbolism of that from when we saw him in, what, it was 20... 2015, 2015, right, when he started his campaign. Down <laughs> that golden escalator. Indeed. I mean, he... And he's aware of the symbolism as well, isn't he? As he, as he sort of fights back at this moment. Absolutely. I mean, he's a master of symbolism. He's a master of television. He certainly likes to think of himself that way. Um, so a lot of people would say that a lot of his success is due to do with how he knows about media and how mm. to utilize it. So he's definitely trying to craft and control this moment as much as possible. Uh, how, in the hours since the verdict was reached and yeah. those, those guilty verdicts were, were read out, how, as an American, and, and, you know, how have people been sort of responding to it? I mean, I put this to every American I've spoken to today because the sort of the sense must be not quite sure what's happening within the country, if, depending on which side of the, the political divide you, you find yourself on. This is very true. I mean, I sort of bring an international perspective. So I'm half British, I'm half Canadian. I've lived in the US a quarter of my life. I've lived in the North and I've lived in Mississippi. Now, when I started in Mississippi, Barack Obama was president, and then Donald Trump got elected, and things changed drastically. People felt vindicated um, in a way that they hadn't before to come out with things that um, we would see, and certainly Canada would see as politically incorrect. Yes. Um, so there's absolutely a sense that um, uh, it's, it's sort of um, all hands off in terms of there are no rules anymore. There's no norms anymore. So you don't really know what you're going to expect or judge from people because as I was saying to someone yesterday, now that Trump has four years and certainly has a substantial political record for a non-politician, mm -hmm. um, people are no longer, unless it's his base, necessarily could be assumed to stick with him. Right. I, yeah, I mean, I went to a pub recently um, in Kentucky Right. And I was at the bar. They saw that I said, had said doctor and said, oh, doctor, what? I said, I'm a presidential historian. And he said, oh, well, what do you think about Trump? And I said, well, um, you know, I, I do have a vote. I'm not American. I was very diplomatic, um, not knowing what side of the spectrum they're on, these middle aged white men in sort mm -hmm. of flannel. But they said, no, no, no. Um, you know, I, I, don't, I don't agree with some of the Trump things. And so these are people who you wouldn't necessarily be able to judge based on demographics, uh. what side they'd be on. But it's interesting to see how people's views may have changed based on his record. And do you think there is going to be any change in how people see him as a result of the convictions? And, uh, sorry for calling you an American when you're a Canadian. That's, a, that's almost a cardinal sin. <laughs> Maybe one day. <laughs> <laughs> Apologise about that. Look, are people going to be uh, put off by this? I know the polling is not entirely clear. There is some reporting that some within the middle, some perhaps undecided, younger, uh, ethnically diverse groups who may be leaning Trump with a conviction would then not lean Trump. I mean, there's any sense that people will be put off because it's a lot of it's baked in. They know who this man is. Yes, absolutely. So the base is he's hoping to rile up the base. He's hoping that he did that last night. There are reports that his mood elevated at sort of breaking the internet in terms of the amounts of potential donors who came yeah, to his, his website. Yeah, his website crashed because exactly. so many people were joining it. Exactly. They said. So that's what they said. That's what they said. Um, so uh, we don't know. Obviously, it could be a glitch. Um, but there is certainly the base is not leaving him. But this question, I think, as it turns into these two men who have this um, a substantial political record. It's a question of who turns out on November 5th. Mm. If Biden has issues with his diverse base turning out, especially young voters, maybe concerned about, about the you know, protests in Gaza and all these sorts of things, um, if they don't turn out, he's got a problem, especially in Michigan. Mm -hmm. um, so this is a, a problem on both sides, and you could see the Biden campaign being very cautious in how they respond today. Yeah, we are expecting to hear from President Biden later, and mm. I put that exact point to our Mark Stone, saying that I guess the... The administration have to be careful whilst, you know, celebrating the way that the justice system has worked and that no one's above the law, not to be crowing about the victory, because, of course, that won't play well for those who are still in the middle and undecided. Absolutely. And, of course, Hunter Biden is facing his own legal troubles, uh, so that complicates things even further. Yeah. Um, so, for the Republican side, I don't know if you have seen... Lindsey Graham has already been out on social media saying that Republicans uh, who are against this uh, decision uh, needs to be very careful about how they proceed. Sort of rallying the Republicans to, to continue with this uh, Trump talking point that this was all a sham and all, all a witch hunt. Uh, how much currency is that going to keep within the Republican group, do you think? I think it depends what issue you're talking about. When we were talking about E. Jean Carroll, I think it carried a lot of weight because a lot of his base, white men in particular, who are not college educated, would 
be convinced by this idea, perhaps, that it could be them who could be accused of something like sexual assault or harassment. And so that sort of conspiracy theory and this anti-Me Too movement is, is sort of very um, appealing to, to some demographic. However, if you're talking about something that's more complex, like the case that was just had a verdict on, um, you know, the hush money, uh, it's, it's harder for people to relate to. Not many people have paid off a porn star. So <laughs> it's, it's kind of challenging mm. to think. Um, that this is going to change many minds. But of course, that wasn't the illegality, was it? The no, paying off is fine. No. It's not. It's the fact that they didn't put it through the books in the right way. Exactly. Right. <laughs> Doctor, we're going to come back to you in a moment. Right, it is four o'clock. Good afternoon. We are waiting for former President Donald Trump to take to that lectern behind the microphone and begin his news conference. It's 24 hours since he became the first American president, current or former, to be convicted of a crime. A jury of 12 found Mr Trump guilty of each of the 34 charges he faced for falsifying business records over that payment made to Stormy Daniels in the run-up to the 2016 presidential election. Well, we are joined in the studio by the presidential historian Dr Laura Ellen Smith uh, and, of course, by our correspondents in the United States, in DC and in New York City. We've got Mark Stone in Washington and... James Matthews, actually in Trump Tower as well. We'll go to those guys in a moment. But first to you, uh, Dr Smith, thank you very much for being with us. Just put into some context where we find ourselves in the story of America, that former president, now convicted felon, is about to give a news conference and still looks like being the man who is going to win the keys to the ha White House in come November. It's a historic day for sure. Um, but we've got to remember that we're only a couple of months away from the 50th anniversary of Nixon's resignation. And so you have to wonder if Nixon hadn't been pardoned, if he had actually gone through the process, the criminal process, would we find ourselves in this same position? A lot of people thought that we, after Nixon, Ford tried to move the country on. All of those divisions, civil rights, Vietnam, he tried to move the country and bring it together. Some people, especially when he died in 2005, 6, people thought that was the right decision. But now there are these real questions about how to ensure that everyone, uh, no matter who they are, is uh, brought to justice. That's obviously what we saw in New York overnight. Yeah, and with that sense of being brought to justice, has it just deepened the divide that existed within America prior to those verdicts being read out? Yes. Um, yes, it, it has. It really this sort of intransigence of uh, the schism that we see um, is, is absolutely uh, prevalent. And it's very hard to see how uh, the GOP, in particular the Republican Party, moves forward. Mm -hmm. um, it's hard to imagine a sort of post-Trump era and what that would even look like. They are in the woods. Um, we were talking previously about tax cuts being one of their litmus test issues. As, as always, this, mm -hmm. is, this is even a Reagan issue. But they did change the tax code. It was the biggest change in 30 years under Donald Trump. And people found it confusing and it didn't help. It was only really for businessmen. It was for the top 1% who really yeah. benefited. So it's this question as to really whether that's going to keep people who are not his base from coming to the polls. Absolutely. Well, let's bring in a Dr Laura Ellen Smith, presidential historian, who I'm pleased to say is here with me in the studio. Uh, Dr Smith, look, you sat through that as well alongside me. Uh, a, a few uh, comments exchanged that we perhaps won't uh, be broadcasting. But what did you make of the in entirety of what you saw in put it into the context of mm. those kind of events that Donald Trump has done since he decided he was going to run for office back in 2015. Absolutely. I mean, first off, I'm feeling a little bit left out because apparently I'm one of the few people in the world who doesn't have a non-disclosure agreement. Um, but it's right. There's, this is classic Donald Trump. He came out fighting. Um, the individual has not changed. He's concerned about his legacy. He wants to have the last word. He even referenced George Washington, who may be turning over in his grave. But... The context has changed. Richard Nixon infamously said, I am not a crook. And now we officially have an ex-president who is a crook. Mm -hmm. So this has changed things. He's using the same tropes, cultural populism. He's referring to immigration, very racist, xenophobic language, very similar to as he did in 2015. Except those supporters there today were not paid. They were a smaller group, but they were not paid. And Melania wasn't there as well. Yeah, and we, we did talk about this mm. while he was speaking. Do you think that's important? I mean, it'd probably be important for, for Trump himself, because I, I guess he would have liked his wife by his side when he faces this moment. Mm -hmm. But what about more broadly and how he's seen by, by supporters? It's a question as to really who he's appealing to. Does Melania really have a base of supporters? Probably not. Um, so he's probably banking on the idea that 
it's not going to really matter to his base. Interestingly enough, you know, both sides, the Biden camp and the Trump camp, are calling each other fascists. They're using these terms. And yet he's the one with neo-Nazis in his base. He was the one who was first endorsed by David Duke of the KKK. So he still has to deal with those fundamental issues. Okay, that's right. Dr. Smith, appreciate the thank you. As, uh, as always, thank you very much for that.